Am I on? There we go. Hey, hey. all right. Uh, we're going to invite the children up and the youth who are uh, Sunday morning live. This is the last morning of Sunday morning live. So um, next beginning next week, there will be no Sunday morning live, but I'll invite our children and our youth up. We were, uh, we were talking earlier about this whole lineup, and we thought maybe it'd be a great idea if we set up a slip and slide uh, for our children to leave. And it, it might, that might be something that would require society approval. So I'll bring, I'll bring a motion forward tomorrow night at the meeting for a slip and slide. Uh, until then, we'll just line up orderly. Look at you all. Love it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for our children. We thank you for the ways that you use this time to inform and equip their faith. And Lord, their faith is not to be looked down upon. We are to learn from our children just as much as they are to learn from us. And so we thank you that uh, they will be grown in this time in their faith and that uh, through that, we will be challenged as parents and family members and um, fellow congregants with them uh, that we will be challenged to grow in our faith as well. So be with the leaders this morning, be with the children and youth, and we pray all these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you all later. They're so quiet. What's going on? <laughs> they haven't had bear paws yet, that's why. When they get the bear paws, they... They amp, amp things up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jay. For any of you who don't know me, I serve here as the associate pastor. Uh, my time is primarily spent with the youth and young adults and other responsibilities as necessary. That's like the official job description, as other needs arise. And so as other needs arise, Jen says, hey, Jay, another need arose. And then we tackle things together. So um, we have been working our way through uh, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 to 18, which, uh, which say, and uh, as I read, Father, we bring this time to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that you use your word to speak uh, to our hearts, and we pray that you would do that now. Um, so it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And always keep praying for the Lord's people. And so we've been focusing specifically on the portion of this text which uh, is referred to as the armor of God. And so uh, as we've looked through this passage, we've looked at what it means to gird your loins with the belt of truth as you prepare for battle. And I gave a de I didn't give a demonstration. I gave a, an example of what that looks like as you tie things around and Gird your loins. Uh, we looked at the breastplate of righteousness, and Jen reminded us of the importance of spiritual CPR, which means to confess and turn away from sin, to pursue holiness and rest and re restoration. Uh, we looked at the shoes, which are the readiness that come from the gospel of peace, and we saw Jen's extensive shoe collection, although she is not a shoe person, she said. Um, that was a big Rubbermaid bin and more at home, I'm told. So, um, yeah, and we got another acronym, uh, which was ART, Acknowledge Reality, 
uh, give him rain, and we give thanks. And we looked at the shield of faith, which extinguishes the fiery arrows of the enemy, which he fires at us in abundance. And so as we've looked at the armor of God, we've noticed that what we have as the armor of God is primarily defensive. Its function is defensive. We're told that our enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking to devour its prey. And that's why we put on the armor of God. That's why we need to be defensive and put on that armor. So I have a question for you this morning. What is the most important part of the body? Marnie is doing this. We got head. The head is the most important part of the body. And why is that? Well, it houses your brain. It houses your brain. And your brain controls and coordinates everything in your body. The brain is mission control. It controls our bodies and it gives us our coordination how we think, how we act, how we react is all determined by the brain. Our memories and our feelings and our emotions are stored in our brain. Our brain is what actually makes us human. One scientist said, your brain is you. Everything else is just plumbing and scaffolding, which might be might be onto something there. Um, I like to snowboard. Um, I, when I was living in Quebec, I got out a lot more often than, uh, than I have now. And we have hills here. Um, but in Quebec, we had hills that we had snowboard on. And so, um, so this year, I got out once locally, and, and it was okay. But then I took a real trip uh, with my friend to Mont Tremblant. And we, we try and get out to Tremblant once a year. And, um, and this year we were, we were out and we were having a good time. And, um, I have an app on my phone that tracks my speed. And so, uh, this one morning we, we hit the slopes first thing in the morning and, and our first run, look at the speed and we're like, oh yeah, it's going to be a good day. And so we're going, we're going. And then, uh, I was on this one run and we, we did this one run. And after I did it, I go, I bet you I can get a a higher speed on that run if we hit it again. And so we go down and we're, we're going down that run and I'm going and as I'm taking this one turn, I feel the speed and I'm like, oh yeah, this is it, this is it. I'm gonna hit my top speed for the day. And as I got extra confident in myself, kind of stood up with pride, which if you know anything about snowboarding, you never want your knees to be doing what mine are doing right now. Your knees need to be bent. And so as my knees were up and I was turning, I caught an edge and I fell backwards down the hill and I hit my head. And I saw stars because that's what happens when you hit your head when you're going that fast. And I was able to shake things off. Uh, and as I've shared that story with some people, the first question, what do you think the first question that they ask is? Were you wearing your helmet? And thankfully, I was wearing my helmet. So um, I was wearing a helmet, but I did suffer from some concussion. Um, like, I had a concussion. <laughs> and so for, for a week or so, uh, I had some dizziness, and um, I was kind of unsettled. But if I were not wearing my helmet, what would have happened? Where would I be right now? It was so important for me to be wearing. Sam's pointing at, he's not pointing at the roof either. <laughs> um, it's so important to be wearing our helmet. The other day, uh, our two boys were out on their bikes and uh, Michelle and I were driving home and we saw them on the road while on the sidewalk. And uh, as we drove by, one of our boys, and I won't out who, but if you know them, you probably figure it out. Uh, I look over and his helmet is on the handlebar of his bike. And I yell out, I go, your helmet's not doing anything. What? Huh? 
put it on, man. Oh, okay, I put it, I put it on. And then, of course, I forgot. I'm like, you didn't forget because it's dangling on the handlebars. Bringing your helmet is not enough. You need to put your helmet on. Actually, when I was thinking of this, I, I thought, uh, I was like, I Googled helmets on handlebars of bikes. And so, in case you guys haven't noticed, when I preach, I spend a lot of time on the internet. I share, and I, I end up doing rabbit trails a little bit and finding things on the internet. But then they tie in, so st stick with me for a second. Um, I Googled helmet on handlebars. And, and I, came up, I came across an image and uh, I clicked on it to follow it to its link. And it was a whole blog post uh, of this lady who was at a, um, like a public bike riding event where the roads are closed. And she was observing that people had their helmets with them at this event but they, many of them had the helmets on their handlebars or in the basket behind them or on a backpack. And, and so she was kind of just looking at this phenomenon. Why are so many people showing up to this biking event where the roads have been closed off um, and they have their helmets with them, but they're not wearing them? And her takeaway was that the threat of danger was not there. And because the threat of danger, and, and the threat of danger being other cars on the road, because the threat of the cars not being on the road wasn't there, that they removed their helmets and just carried them with them. Now, just because there's no cars doesn't mean that all of the dangers associated with riding a bike have been removed. But there was no perceived threat of danger, and so their helmets were off. And I wonder how that relates to us in our spiritual walk. If we forget that our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, continually on the lookout for someone to devour, we must always be on the lookout for the threat of danger. And I'm not talking about looking demons under every rock and behind every bush and just and, and, and you know being afraid. We're not to operate in a, in a spirit of fear, but we are to be aware that the enemy wants to get us, wants to get us off track. There's, um, well, and, and because of this continued reality of threat of danger, we should never be unprepared. No soldier would ever go into battle without wearing their helmet. There's this iconic scene at the starting of the movie, Saving Private Ryan, where they're um, storming the beaches of Normandy. And it's very intense. And um, it's, it's quiet, quiet, quiet. And then all of a sudden, they open the gates of the U-boats, and the battle is on. And there's this one spot where, this one scene where a soldier is sitting down, he's kind of taking cover, and a bullet hits his helmet. And he's kind of in shock. And then he takes his helmet off to look at the bullet. And, and that's the end of the soldier. Because he took his helmet off. We need to keep our helmets on our heads. And it's the same spiritually. This morning we're looking at this very short phrase found in verse 17 that says, Take the helmet of salvation. And so why must we keep our helmet on? Well, the helmet is a reminder and assurance that the work is completed in Christ. It's important for us to note that this is actually not the first time that we see these words used in Scripture. Breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59, uh, second half of verse 15 and on to 17, it says, The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. This text in Isaiah is a messianic text written 
uh, almost 800 years before Jesus. And it's speaking specifically of Jesus' work on the cross. And we see that righteousness and salvation belong to the Lord. Righteousness and salvation belong to Jesus. It is his righteousness that we put on as a breastplate. And it is him who brings salvation. Isaiah actually, throughout the book, regularly pairs righteousness and salvation together as the work of the Lord. Pointing to Jesus as the only righteous one and the only one through whom salvation is to be obtained. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven and earth by which mankind can be saved. One writer has said, God's righteousness, his reliable commitment to fulfill all his promises to his people means he must act to deliver them from all their enemies, including the greatest enemy of all, their sin, and the separation from God it causes. The work that he must do is the work of salvation. Paul also uses this phrase uh, in mentioning the helmet of salvation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, where he refers to it as the helmet of the hope of salvation. And I think that gives us a good picture of uh, what, what we are talking about this morning. Uh, it is this promise that we are no longer far from God that gives us hope as believers. This promise of salvation that the separation has been dealt with. And so putting on the helmet of salvation then is reminding ourselves that our hope of salvation is secure in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We sang this morning, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away. When we talk about taking the helmet of salvation, this is what our hearts are singing. Reminding ourselves that Jesus loved us, he died to save us, and in doing so he carried our sin far away. John Wesley speaking of the helmet of salvation, says, the armor for this is the hope of salvation. The lowest degree of this hope is a confidence that God will work the whole work of faith in us. The highest is a full assurance of future glory added to the experiential knowledge of pardoning loved. And so arm, or pardoning loved, armed with this helmet, the hope of joy set before him Christ endured the cross and despised the shame, which is a reference to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Jesus completed the work required for our salvation, and that work will never be undone. Sometimes when people ask me when I was saved, I say 2,000 years ago. Because that's when the work was done. I received that work when I was made aware of my need for that work. But the work of being saved was done 2,000 years ago. And the finished work on the cross was for those of us who have trusted in him as our Savior. But it was also for anyone who has not yet recognized or is considering their need for a savior. Beginning a relationship with Jesus starts with three very simple words, I need you. And if you haven't said those words to Jesus, you can do that now. There's nothing stopping you from saying those words right now and nothing that you've done up until this point can get in the way of that because Jesus' work is complete. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him 
shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nothing you've done can stop you from having a relationship with Jesus because his work is complete. And so if salvation is one time and it's in the past, why do we need a helmet? What what does this talk about a helmet then? Well, Satan's attack is against our heads. If you here this morning or following online just said those words, I need you, uh, for the first time, or if you've been a Christian for 60 years, tomorrow you're going to be faced with doubts. If you're anything like the six-year-old me, you're going to want to repeat that prayer every night and become a Christian again every time you go to bed. The helmet is a reminder that we don't need to do that. The helmet is a reminder of Christ's work. Have you ever screwed up in your Christian walk? Is there a habitual sin that plagues you? What does that inner dialogue sound like? Oh, I thought you were a Christian. If you were really a Christian, you would never fill in the blank. And this is actually the very way that Satan tried to get at Jesus. If you truly are the Son of Man. And Jesus stood firm on the Word of God and its promises. I love this passage in Micah, which serves for us as a reminder, as we are faced with conviction, which may be confused with guilt, because guilt comes from the enemy, conviction comes from the Lord. If there is a behavior that you're struggling with and you want to make that right, that's conviction. If there's a behavior that you're struggling with and you're led to believe that you're worthless and no good or maybe on the outs with God because of it, That's guilt, and that comes from the enemy. And Micah chapter 7, uh, verses 7 to 9 say, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And I love this part. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, The Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. Did you pick up on the words that were used there? Righteousness, salvation, as belonging to the Lord. When the enemy gets in your face and says, you suck, you're not a good Christian, you sin, You're out. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Do not rejoice over me. What happened is between me and the Lord, and guess what? He already dealt with it. You have no power in my life. Satan attempts to use guilt to drive a wedge between us and God, but that wedge has been been obliterated on the cross. Doubt and guilt and even the continued presence of sin cannot separate us from God as he sees us through Jesus' completed work. And as we remind ourselves of this, we are reminding ourselves of the hope of salvation, which is in Jesus. This too shall pass. The battle that Satan wages on us is, is fought mostly in our mind, and he wants us to believe things that simply aren't true. Sometimes our mind wants to believe these things. We have a, an image that we're going to put up on the screen, uh, and as we put this on, we know, you look at this, and you know that 
this image is not moving. But if you look at it long enough, your mind actually wants to believe that it is. And I hope that's actually working for you. <laughs> As you, as you look at it. Uh, but it, it, our mind wants us to believe that this image is actually rotating and, and swirling around. And this is why it's so important for us to know what God says. Because we can't always trust the way that things appear in our mind. We can't always trust our perceived reality. Sometimes, even though we know that Jesus has dealt with sin once and for all, we get tricked into believing that it's still separating us from him. And so, taking up the helmet is reminding ourselves that our sin has been nailed to the cross. Have I said that enough this morning? Your sin has been nailed to the cross. Whether you have a relationship with Jesus or not, it's, it's accepting that and responding to that that begins that relationship with Jesus. Uh, another, another preacher has said this, the helmet of salvation is that great hope of final salvation that gives us confidence and assurance that our present struggle with Satan will not last forever. And we will be victorious in the end. We know the battle is only for this life. And even a long earthly life is no more than a split second compared to eternity with our Lord in heaven. We are not in a race that we can lose. And that's why Paul tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Taking that helmet of salvation is a part of that renewing of your mind. Getting into the word is a renewing of your mind. Seeking the Lord in prayer is a renewing of your mind. Fellowshipping with other believers and having them come around you and be a part of your journey, pointing you to Jesus is a renewing of your mind. Doing these things is putting on the helmet of salvation. So we have the picture of the, the Roman helmet up on the screen. And when you look at that, what is the first thing that you take notice of? Kind of like this mohawk thing that's going on here. I'm going to try that. Jen's <laughs> shaking her head no. <laughs> um, no, I'll stick with the shiny look. Um, which also brings attention maybe. Um, but, but that's what happens. When you look at this image, you notice the helmet. You take notice. The, Romans, the Roman soldier's helmet made them stand out. Great care went into crafting the soldier's helmet. And, and these weren't mass produced. They were done by one person at a time. Uh, and great care went into it, they were covered in symbols. Symbols of the empire. Uh, there were animals to do with their agriculture. And often there were images of their deities or gods that were on there as well. And then the top was a dyed horse hair. And sometimes it even flowed all the way down their back. And they had different helmets that they used for their uh, parades and ceremonies. And the helmets were often a focal point in these public ceremonies. They were made not only to bring the attention to the soldier, but to the greatness of Rome. The helmet was often the most beautiful part of the armor. And so when we look at the helmet as being the helmet of salvation, we are reminded that salvation is noticeable. It's actually no surprise that the helmet is attached to salvation then because there is no more beautiful and elaborate gift than the gift that God has given us in salvation. And salvation changes us. 
When we enter into into relationship with Jesus, we are given the Holy Spirit who transforms us into the likeness of Jesus. And this change is noticeable. Your family, your friends, your coworkers, they see a different life being lived. John Wesley also spoke of right belief and right living, but came to the recognition that or, or came to the realization uh, that what was important was a right heart. And the Christian life is living our faith out loud as we live lives that are transformed by the Holy Spirit. And as we live those lives, people take notice. You may have heard the quote, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. And here's the reality. If you are living a gospel life, you'll need to use words. Because someone is going to say, dude, what happened to you? Oh, that was Jesus. Tell me more. Our lives put Jesus on display. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And he goes on to say, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our salvation is noticeable. It's meant to be noticeable. And so the question is, is your salvation noticeable? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And when we, when we take up the helmet of salvation, we are reminding ourselves of the hope that is assured in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We are reminding ourselves that no matter how things seem, God's promise stands. And our perception of reality does not change who God is. And we are visibly transformed by the continual renewing of our minds in Christ Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for the finished work of salvation that Jesus completed on the cross. And thank you that through his resurrection, we can enter into eternity with you. Father, it's this assurance of that hope that we want to live. Remind us daily to take up the helmet of salvation, protecting our thoughts and our minds from Satan's futile attempts to reverse your work. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. And so as we worship,